Judges chapter number 3. Judges chapter number 3. I'm sure somewhere over the course of time we'll look at this, but uh, hopefully the new fresh light we can look at tonight. Thank you. And starting at verse number 12, we'll divide it up, look at it, then we're going to come back to the beginning and look at it all over again. Amen. That's what Bible study is, right? And the children of, the, uh, of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. I think it's interesting that the Lord strengthens Iglon, king of Moab, even though he is this heathen man um, and doesn't have a personal uh, uh, knowledge uh, of the Lord. He doesn't really uh, have the best uh, strength to go into battle. But the Bible says that the Lord strengthened Eglon. And so I, I think that as we look at the Word of God, that when the people of God continually do wrong, there's this cycle that they get in, that they ignore God, that they don't live holy, that they don't follow the commandments of God, that God says, well, wait a second. I'm only going to tolerate so much. And then I'm going to allow you to be chastened. Someone look up Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter number 12, and read verse number 5 through 14. Hebrews 12, 5 through 14. Whatever you have, just read it.
And so this is what's happening in the Word of God. God's saying, listen, this week I mean, I'm not going to get there yet, but we're going to come back and talk about this. This weekend of me, I, I, I've set some boundaries. You've exceeded the boundaries. You're not listening. And so I've got to show you that I am God. And what I speak needs to be uh, adhered to. And you need to listen to me because I am God. And there are some repercussions. You are going to go through some difficult times here because you are not being obedient to me. Amen. So things can happen in our life because we're not being obedient to God. Uh, sometimes it may be sickness. I'm not saying all sickness. Uh, sometimes it may be the enemy gets an upper hand on us. Sometimes it's a good time to stop and evaluate what is going on here. And evaluation may bring to our mind that, wow, I've not really been obedient to God. I've disobeyed God. And God is allowing this so that He can bring me back into alignment with where He wants me to be. And that's what He's doing to the nation of Israel here. And the Bible says, And he, or Eglah, gathered unto him the children of Ammon, Ammon and Amalek. Whoa, that is a bad crew. We'll talk more about them in a little bit. So here we have Eglah. We have Amnon, we have Amalek, uh, 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 we, uh, the Bible says, and they went and they smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. What's the city of palm trees? Does anyone know? Take a guess. First big city they conquered. Jericho. That's right. The city of palm trees. All right. And so the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of, of, of Moab, 18 years. Wow, so Amalek, Amnon, and Moab are coming against them. And now the children of Israel are serving these individuals. The Bible says, But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud. How would you like to have that name? Ehud. Hi there, Brother Ehud. And uh, so Ehud, uh, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present uh, unto Eglon, the king of Moab. What is the present? I would say that probably it was food. When you begin to look at this king, uh, it's obvious he liked food. And so the Bible says, But Ehud had made a dagger which he had, had two edges, of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his thigh. And when he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. A very fat man. So he was a big man. He was overweight. And when he had made an end to offering the present, uh, here the Bible says that Eglon, he sent away the people that bore, uh, bore the present. I want to be alone. Here's Ehud and King Long. And he himself turned again from the quarries or from graven images. The man of God turns from graven images that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret uh, errand unto you, O king, who said, Keep silent. And all who stood by him went out from him. Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in the summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message, a message from God unto you. And he arose out of the seat. The message of God will always be the sword of the Spirit. Won't. The message of God to anyone will always be biblically based. The sword of the Spirit. Amen. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And when the haft also went in after the blade, the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and dirt came out. You know, the only way to get dirt out of our lives, and I know what this is all about, but I'm just telling you, the only way to get dirt out of our lives is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God gets the dirt out. 
Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. When he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw, behold, the doors of the parlor was locked, they said, Surely he covers his feet in his summer chamber. He's asleep. And they tarried there uh, uh, till they were ashamed. Could have been several hours, a whole day, we don't know. And behold, he, Eglon, opened not the doors of the parlor, therefore they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. Man, there is so much we can talk about when we look at this. We look at the pattern of destruction. The pattern of destruction is this, is that Israel is not completely sold out for God. And they're not being sold out for God is going to cost them. It brings them into captivity. You may say, well, I'll allow this to be a little bit in my life. I, 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 I'll get rid of so much sin. Or I'll get rid of so much things that God has asked. But I'm not getting rid of it all. I still want to dab my feet. I still want to have a little bit. Just a little bit. But, but the most part of it, the most I've gotten rid of. But we see here by example, that the children of Israel, when they did not wholeheartedly follow the Lord, it cost them way more than what they ever wanted to pay. We have got to be a sold out people. God wants us to be sold out. God wants us to be on fire. What does the Bible say? Those that are not hot or cold but lukewarm, He's going to spew them out of His mouth. Amen. God doesn't take folks who just go a little bit, but God takes folks who are sold out all the way. Sell it all out to God. Amen. Doesn't mean that we keep some things that when we get angry, we can use them. It doesn't mean that we keep some things that when no one else is around, that we utilize them. Amen. It means that we get rid of sin in our life. There are lusts that we may deal with in our life. We have to conquer that lust and get it put under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Even if a little bit is there, it can become detrimental. The enemy can come in and take over. And so here it is. They didn't learn their lesson. They thought that their enemy was very, very small and had no power over them. Can I tell you, you may think that that little grudge, you may think that that little habit, you may think that that little sin is not a big deal. It will never take power over me. Oh, don't ever count yourself to be so strong. Amen. Don't be so foolish to think that you can hold on to a little thing and it will not harm you. It is a little leaven, the Bible says, that leaveneth the whole it ruins it all. So we as believers have to make sure that there is no room for sin in our life. No holding to a little grudge. No little white lies. No things that are secret that no one knows about. Amen. But it's just our little secret. Amen. They need to be prayed through in the presence of God. Because that thing that you think is not powerful can be the very thing that can overtake you and destroy you and bring you captive. That's right, Brother Seville. That's right, Pastor. Old sinful habits, they have a way of luring up again if we're not careful. So the nation of Israel, they go off into sinful living and God slaps their hand, has already slapped their hands for disobedience. And the intensity of sin increases, and so judgment comes. What did Hosea say? He said, you sow to the wind, you're going to reap a whirlwind. Amen. So we got to get rid of sin. Amen. Uh, we think it's a little thing, but it, it becomes a big thing. Here it is that, that Reuben and Gab and half of Manasseh, they failed to attack Moab and Ammon and the Amalekites and their failure to do so, it brings back a time of being overtaken by what they did not destroy. We've got to get rid of sin. We've got to get rid of things that aren't pleasing to God. 
And so it's a problem from the past. And so to look even closer at this, and I know that you're familiar, but let's just rehearse it quick in our ears. So these individuals, the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Malachites, if, if you remember way back in the Bible in the Old Testament, there were two men, a man named Abraham who left his homeland of being an idol worshiper and making idols. And he fell in love with God. He left this family. He left that lifestyle far behind. And he really became a man who knew how to build altars. You look at his life and he builds altars. He's always seeking God's direction for what God has for his life. Abraham wanted to help his nephew Lot, but not Lot didn't have the same heart's desire that Abraham did. While Abraham was building altars, Lot was pitching his tents. And Lot wanted more and greater and better and, and things that, 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 that he could create a, a home with. In fact, one day he goes down to Sodom and it's a very fertile land. It's a wonderful place to live. I mean, but there's everything there. It's lush for the just. I mean, just so nice. What a wonderful place to live. But it was a very sinful place. It was really a place that when you looked at it, it, it was a place where homosexuals, it was their headquarters. It was a place where there was filth and lust and wickedness. And so Lot had, had been brought out of there. God had called him out of there uh, 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 before. But we find that, that, that he finds himself there. And uh, uh, as God sends angels, and we know the story, how that God sent angels, and as they're going out, that his wife turns around, and she's turned into a pillar of salt. Let me just say this. This is for me having kids. This is for anybody having kids, grandkids, the influence of the next generation in this church. We may think that sometimes we need simple things. It's a fertile place. We need to be relevant. We need to be a, a church that, that, that is accepting. All these things. But we look and we find out that there as they run, Lot and his family, they take refuge in a cage. We find that, that his girls have been raised in this very drunken place, this wicked place. Though he got them out. The wickedness was still in them. Oh, it's just a movie. Oh, it's just some friends. Oh, it's just some entertainment. God help us. Because when the world gets home, we want to win them for Jesus. But if the world's already involved, it can kind of turn out to be devastation. So we know what happened. They learned the finest of what they're about to do in Sodom. So these girls, they spawn the fierce nations. They get daddy drunk and they have, both of them have children. From one comes the, the Moabitess people. From the other comes the Amorites. And then we know that, that from Esau, he fathered a son named Amalek, and there comes the Amalekites. And these are wicked, wicked people. Listen, when we live an unyielded life to God, it produces things that is not pleasing to God. Lot, you were saved. Lot, you knew. But you lived a life that produces wickedness because of where you allowed yourself to live. Let me just ask us, I'm not condemning tonight. I want us to be challenged from the pulpit to the pew. Where are we living at tonight? Do we live in a place that is so close to the world? Do we live in a place that's entertained by the world, that, 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 it, that is teased by the world, that place that is very fertile in this world's eyes? Or are we pitching and building an altar and seeking God and saying, God, I'm staying as far away from that as what I can because I want to honor you with my life. 
You see, this is where it all started. It all started by wicked living and association. And then it happens that it's not destroyed when God says, destroy all that. It's not a, 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 a adhered by the Craig. They don't adhere to it. They keep a little bit of it there. And we find that it becomes now something that they consider weak. It becomes something so powerful that it overtakes the nation of Israel. And now for 18 years, they live in captivity. That 18 speaking of judgment. That number. They are facing the judgment of God. Do you know one day each one of us will be judged by God? Amen. How we live our life. How we conduct our life. Amen. How holy we live. How much we allow uh, things to be tolerated. How much we allow things to be in our life. When God asks us to destroy it. His cry to us is be ye holy as I am holy. Our standard of holiness isn't marked by our comparison to one another our comparison to the world, but our standard of holiness is marked by a comparison to a holy God who asks us to be as He is. Amen. So here it is. Remember this, that the lust of the flesh can only produce that, uh, that, that same lust in a person's life. What you, what, what, what you reap, you will, you will sow. I need to say this, that sins of people affect others. Now here as a younger nation, here as a nation who had nothing to do with Lot, a, 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 a nation really that, that, that knew nothing about Lot's daughters, here as a nation that had nothing to do, some of these folks, with getting rid of the Amalekites and the Amorites and, and the Moabites, but because the generation before didn't take care of it, the ripple effect goes on. If we do, do not hold to righteousness and holiness in Pentecost and biblical truths, there is coming a day if the Lord should tarry that the next generation is going to read what we I can I have to say what you told me about that tomorrow? Some of you may be familiar with Hallmark. Don't fall out with me. There are some things that are good. There are some things that are bad. But for the most part, it's pretty wholesome. And so, uh, now this is not what Hallmark said. Disclaimer. This is what someone being interviewed who's an actor for Hallmark. Okay? So follow me. So good, wholesome, oftentimes God in the middle of some of these movies, very wholesome. But they have an actor who is openly gay. And uh, in his interview, he was asked and he said, don't you think that it's time for Hallmark to bring out a movie about a gay couple? He said, I think it is. And I would be willing to be part of that because I see them rapidly changing. Well, I'm not saying Hallmark's person, I don't know a lot about it. But what I'm saying is we tolerate a little bit and someday we, we reap the world. We become so tolerant we become so tolerant. Our lips are sealed on the sanctity of life. Our lips can become sealed on the sanctity of marriage. Our lips can become sealed on the distinction of men and women. Our lips can become sealed upon the Holy Ghost. Our lips can become sealed upon the holiness of God and God's anticipation for holy people. Amen. Our lips can be sealed, but while they're sealed, there's another generation that's coming up. And what we allow in moderation, amen, is going to affect them and can bring them captive. And they will face the judgment of God. The 18 years, they will face the judgment of God for what we did not conquer when God has called us to conquer. God, help us tonight. Let's conquer our homes. Amen. Let's let them be holy places 
where our holy God is, is in charge of all. Amen. Let's let our travels and our entertainment be full of godliness. Let's let our churches not become a place of mere entertainment. Amen. But let it be a place where the Holy Ghost moves and the Spirit of God is, is the orchestrator and conductor of everything. Because if we don't get rid of it, amen, somewhere down the line, judgment will fall. Amen. The Bible says that here was a man, Ehud, the son of Gera. Ehud means to be joined together, to unite. Gera means meditation. Amen. When we gather together and we meditate upon the Word of God, we are more than conquerors with Christ Jesus our Lord. Hey man, what is all Acts chapter two, number two about? It is about unity. How does the people of God, amen, see the Spirit of God move and work? It is by unity. Where two or three are gathered together, where we agree together in His name, touching any one thing. It is the unity. So when we meditate and un unify ourselves upon the Word of God, the Bible says that Ehud, that this man had a two-edged dagger, amen, and he concealed it under his right thigh. Remember this. Some people may have thought in those days that the left hand is a weak hand, but they would have initially looked at his left eye to pull out the dagger for the right hand. But because he was left-handed, it was the opposite, and they didn't even pay attention. And so here it was that Ehud had this double-edged sword or dagger. Amen. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. we got to stick with the Word of God. Amen. That is our weapon. That is what we stand upon. That is what we fight with. Amen. It is the Word of God. It's not what you think. It's not what I think. It's not some history lesson. It is the truth of the Word of God. It is not outdated. It is not disrespected. Maybe by some, but God still honors and respects His Word. Amen. And the Word of God will never return void. Amen. So allow the Word of God to be what fights your battle. And so, here it is, a present. Once again, was it, was it a portion of food? Amen. He certainly liked to eat. And so here in private, and, uh, and it is that 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 that, uh, that Ehud, Amen. He gets the quarries of Gilgal and he doubles back, Amen. He, 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 some sculptured stones, some graven images. Actually, uh, some think that it could be uh, the stones from the Jordan River, Amen. A reminder of the faithfulness of God, Amen. But nonetheless, Amen. Here it is that that, that in the coolest room of the house. That, that the king is, and uh, uh, very popular in this time of year and summer, even as it is for us. And uh, uh, he had said, I have a message from the Lord to you. He conceals uh, the dagger, sends everybody else out, and he thrust it into the belly of Ehud. Now they say the length of that was about from the knuckle to the elbow and then the handle. This guy had big belt. Makes me feel scared. <laughs> it went in so deep, the Bible says, that he couldn't pull it out. The handle was there. And he let go. And in the fact, it was concealed. He could not see it. And so Ehud. He was the executor. But I can tell you this. But God was the judge. God says we have to put this to death. This thing that's dishonoring and displeasing to the kingdom of God. I said destroy the Malachites. I said destroy the Moabites people. I said destroy the Amorites. And there was a remnant was not a false week. But I'll be a judge. This needs to be destroyed. Have you ever thought about letting God just be the judge in your life? Getting rid of things? God, you judge. When we 
look at Ehi, he was a Benjamite. Benjamin, when we look at him, was like a wolf. In Palestine, wolves usually hunted alone. And when they first came, they looked weak. They'd sniff around, they'd appear to be weak to whatever they were getting ready to attack, weak and timid. They have looked like Ehud was weak and timid, less handed. Wolves usually like to take their prey by surprise. That's what Ehud did it. He took them by surprise. But wolves are also known for their perseverance, not tiring out. We have to know something. We have to persevere. Ehud could say, God, you can't use me. I'm left handed. This is considered a sign of weakness. But I need to tell you that if you're ever going to conquer the things of God in your life, you're going to have to realize something. That whatever your weakness may be, and you know what it is, I know what mine is. That God made you that. But God also empowers you to get victorious, even in your weakness. And the second thing is, that, that which is refused by God can be abused and misused by Satan. If we don't surrender everything to God, we see here. A lot of you should have surrendered everything to God. But because you did, now Satan uses it to abuse and misuse. But I love what Ehud did. Sister Tina, he went straight to the source. Well, John Ehud tried to kill some Moabites, some Malachites. He didn't try to do the Aramites, Sister Linda. But Sister Rachel, he went straight to the throne source. He went straight to the throne. I killed the king. That'll get him. Get the source. If there are things in our lives, we need to get to the source of what it is and destroy it. You know what the destroy the, 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 the source is. If it's an insecurity, if it's a jealousy, if it's a lust, if it's an unsurrendered area, then get to the source of it and destroy it before it destroys you. You see, the Word of God helps us conquer the desire for worldly living, selfishness, greed, lack of self-control, and hate. Amen. The Word of God can do it. But we have to be that Ehud. Amen. That that from, from uh, Gera. Amen. We have to meditate upon the Word of God. Amen. And allow God's Word to empower us. Amen. That we can overcome anything in our life. And you know what? That was a perfect getaway. There was no one there. He locked everything up. He took off running. Do you believe God can give us the perfect getaway from anything that we need to conquer? I believe He does. I don't think we have to worry about someone being on our, 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 our trail because God gives us the getaway. Amen. Interesting what we can learn from a hefty man and a lefty man. Hefty becomes hefty, but we don't destroy it in the infancy stage. But lefty becomes powerful when the Spirit of God rises upon our weakness and allows us to conquer the things that are tormenting us in our spiritual life. 
Tonight, would someone like to share a thought? Anything? Amen. I hope that encouraged to help you. I'm sure this, this verse caught me off guard a little bit today. Psalm 34, verse 7. It's a common one we hear all the time. But it says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. But we always stop right there. The end of the verse states, And delivereth them. Amen. And that just caught me off guard because we always talk about the angel of the Lord camp around that. And that we talk about that as we travel, you know, nothing shall we fear. But we always I, we always leave off that last phrase and deliver them. It's one thing to have a hedge of protection for our vows, but deliver them in case that something's coming our way and attacking us. And Amen. the fact that they're attacking us means that they're getting through to us. But the Bible says that the angel of the Lord can't frown that out them. So it's not just a hedge, but when the battle breaks through and deliver them. Amen. And that just completely caught me off guard. Amen. That's good. And then we can forget those those completeness of the word of God. Someone else.